It's now time for Bible reading. Our passage tonight is from Galatians chapter 6. We're looking at verses 11 to 18. Galatians 6, beginning at verse 11. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised, that they may boast about your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to the Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. This is the word of God. I come through, good. Well, uh, it's a privilege to open God's word again to you. Uh, We're still on... Uh, it's the final week of our kind of holiday uh, break, so we're having a break still from our series in Joshua. Uh, if you were here last week, we considered Galatians chapter 3, uh, and we considered those uh, all who rely on the law under the curse of the law, but we looked at Christ becoming a curse for us to redeem us from that curse. Uh, tonight, please keep your, uh, keep your eyes in Galatians chapter 6 there. Before we kick off and before we really jump into it and tell you what we're considering, can I just get you to draw your attention to verse 11? Verse 11 with me. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Now, it's very significant there. Uh, Paul writes most of the New Testament, uh, but we know, however, though he wrote the New Testament, he, for most of his letters, he dictated them. He dictated them to a scribe. He had someone by his side and he told them what to write. We see that in Romans. Uh, and so it's very likely that even this letter, was, uh, Paul was dictating, dictating it to his offsider. But at this point, at the finale of the letter, Paul grabs the pen and he takes it off the scribe. And he starts writing in large letters. Normally he would sign his name off at the end of a letter to show its authenticity. But here he gives a full paragraph in very large writing. Now why does he do that? He does it to show the significance and and how seriously the words that he's writing need to be taken. What does this mean for us? It shows us the significance of what we're going to look at tonight. How how significant these words are. Understand, yes, all Scripture is God-breathed. All of it, from front to back. All Scripture is vital. All of it's necessary. All of it is profitable for us. But the passage we have tonight is in large letters. Is in large letters in the original language. And so to that end, let's pray that the Lord would help us to understand these large letters. Our Father, again, we come before you and we can never approach you enough in prayer. We can never call upon you enough for help. We can never ask you enough for grace and kindness and mercy. Lord, we, have, we never reach a point where we have seen enough of you, where we've seen enough of your glory, where we've comprehended enough of the cross. And so we pray tonight that you would be pleased to pour out your Spirit upon speaker and hearer, Lord, as distractions abound in the world and in our hearts, Lord, even if the lights and the sound were to give way tonight, we pray that you would free us from every distraction so that we might hear your word to us, that we might hear the words of the living God. 
We pray for this time, Lord, that you would bless us. We pray that you would show us more of Christ and you'd show us more of the Christian life that you have saved us to. And we ask for your help, the help of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, tonight I want us to look at three crosses, three crosses that belong to every Christian, three crosses that distinguish the true Christian. Three Christians that belong are uh, three crosses that belong to every Christian. But before we do this, I want uh, we're really only going to focus on one verse really tonight. But just to give the context, so we can see what Paul, why Paul writes what he does here. Now, look at verse twelve a, just the beginning there. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. Now, Paul returns to this theme that he's been speaking about the whole letter. This theme of false teachers and this false gospel that's coming in saying that in order to be saved, you must be circumcised. In, in other words, if you're a Gentile, to be a true Christian, you need to be circumcised, you need to keep the law. And, this, and he comes back to it even at the conclusion. Now, just a couple of things here in the context. Notice how forceful these false teachers are. He says they are trying to compel you to be circumcised. That Greek word there, compel, it means to force, to put under immense pressure. They're trying to pressure you to do this. These were deadly, deadly guest speakers that were occupying the pulpits in Galatia. They were deadly missionaries. Why were they so deadly? Because they had enough Christianity in their message to lead astray spiritually immature Christians maybe those who were babies in the faith. You see, they preached that Jesus died. They preached, that, they preached the empty tomb, but where they deviated in their message was how a person is saved, how a person is justified, made right with God. Paul's gospel is so clearly that a person is made right with God by faith alone in Jesus Christ. The work of Christ, trusting in that. What do, these what do these false teachers say? We are saved by faith in Jesus plus circumcision, plus keeping the law of Moses. And so they deviated. There was enough Christianity, Christianity in it to make it dangerous. And really, this is why our battle and why it continually rages. I cannot tell you enough. I get emails of this that this partnership that we're put under pressure with uh, for, to partner with the Roman Catholic Church, it's continual. I get emails about it. And it's ever, and it's this battle that we've had. See, it, it's as deadly as that because they hold to the Trinity. They hold to Jesus dying and rising. They hold that the Bible is God's word. But where do they deviate? How a person is saved. A person is saved in faith alone. What do they teach? A person is saved by faith plus works. Faith plus Hail Marys. Faith plus confession. Faith plus the Eucharist. Faith plus purgatory. And then your sins will be atoned for. These false teachers in Galatia were deadly. And they were putting the Christians under pressure. Putting the fear into them that if you don't do these things, you can't be saved. So that's the force. Notice the folly and deception of these false teachers. Look at verse 13. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law. Do you hear what he's saying there? Being circumcised doesn't make you fulfill the law of God. Blessing from the law or blessing through the law only comes if you perfectly obey it. We saw last week. Unless you perfectly obey it, you're under its curse. So if you are circumcised, it will profit a person nothing before God. Why? Because we are lawbreakers. We have broken his law. I want you to think about it. If you rob a bank, what good is it to say to the judge, but I didn't cheat on my taxes? Do you see Paul's point here? What good is it to say to God, God, I have never taken your name in vain, and yet to be found guilty of coveting your neighbor's wife? 
What, what good is it to say, God, I have been faithful and committed to gathering to the church assembly and yet being found guilty of not loving the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? You try and keep the law, but you're lawbreakers. We're lawbreakers. And, and so we have to ask, I have to ask you, is there anything that you're subtly putting trust and confidence in? Is there anything? Is it a baptism? Is it your testimony? Is it your gifting or your ministry? Is it how long you've been here? Is it that you've been raised in the faith? Is it that people call you Christian? Jesus plus anything alienates you from grace. And lastly here, with the context, notice the twofold motivation of these false teachers. Look at the motivation. Verse 12, the second half of it. The only reason they do this, that is, compel you to be circumcised, the only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. They teach the law so they'll avoid persecution. We're going to come back to that later. Look at the second motivation, the second half of verse 13. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. What's the motivation? They want disciples after them. They want to boast in getting followers. They want to boast about the flesh. What's going on here? They want to boast in a message that's more palatable, a message, a gospel that's more acceptable. It's more respectable. It's a religion that involves keeping the law of God and being a good person. And Paul says they do it so that they can boast. Understand this. Salvation that involves works always leads to boasting. Every single time, it always does. It must lead to boasting. Why? Because you play a part in saving yourself. You contributed. And Paul's warning against this. And so that's the context. That's what's going on. And now Paul is going to teach what he wants to say in large letters here. I said there are three crosses that distinguish the Christian. Three crosses that belong to every Christian. The first cross that we're going to going to consider is the cross that we boast in the cross that we boast in look at verse 14 and it's in this verse we're going to spend our time verse 14 may i never boast may i never boast except in the cross of our lord jesus christ now we easily and i put myself in this we easily miss the weight of that statement Easily pass over it simply because of the point of time that we live in history. What do I mean by that? Paul's statement here, what he just what we just read, is a shocking statement to first century ears was outrageous and offensive. Unthinkable for him to say that. What do I mean? Crucifixion. It was a horrendous, a horrendous form of capital punishment. It was terrible. It was intentionally, it was designed to be offensive. It was to make people look and want to hide their faces, to be utterly repulsed by it. A crucified person was abhorrent. They were a hideous sight. And they were crucified in public. And when people had to walk past a crucified victim, they would hide their faces. You wouldn't talk about crucifixion at the dinner table. That wasn't civil conversation. It was, it was offensive. Why? Because the victim was stripped of all their clothing. They were made a mockery and they were nailed to the wood and the victim would be screaming in agony. Screaming in agony. And this would be a slow, slow, torturous death. Day after day, they would be hanging upon that cross through the day, the sun would scorch them, and by night they would freeze. And as people passed by, the victim could not hide their shame. They were unable to hide from that cross, and it was a public shaming. They were a hideous sight. Why do we miss? Why do we miss the shock and the controversy of Paul's statement here? Because we live in a time, a point in time, when the emblem of the cross isn't shameful. The emblem and the sign of the cross isn't shameful. How can I say that? 
because we wear crosses as jewellery. We spend our hard-earned money to wear gold and silver crosses. We, have tat- we, get, we pay money to get tattooed with crosses. We wear clothing with crosses. We turn on the TV and we cele- see celebrities and sports stars signing the cross before the cameras. It is fashionable today to be seen with a cross. And so we don't understand. We don't see, we, and again, I put myself in this, we miss the offense and the horror and the scandal of what Paul's saying here. It was offensive to Gentiles and it was offensive to Jews. Remember what we saw last week, cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. The cross is an offense. The old hymn, we sing it here, the old hymn got it right. On a hill far away stood an old rub rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's, it's horrible. It's horrific. And Paul, he boasts in a crucifixion. But he doesn't just boast in any crucifixion. What does he say? I boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying here? Paul boasted in a God who was crucified. He boasted in a God who was crucified. Try preaching that to first century hearers. How is that for an attractive message? How is that for a message to have to, have to proclaim? Try preaching that in the first century where people wouldn't even talk about it in their private discussions, where people would hide their faces. You see, and Paul boasts in the Lord who did that. The, the word Lord and cross, they don't fit in the same sentence. Do you understand that? They're incompatible, and yet Paul combines them. Try preaching about a king who was crucified to most people who never saw the resurrection. Try and convince them of that. Most people didn't see Jesus raised. And yet Paul, Paul boasted in this. He boasted in this. Now contrast Paul with the false teachers. What Paul boasts in and what the false teachers boast in. They boast in their works. They boast in keeping the law. They boast in gaining followers after themselves. They boast in a religion that's palatable and respectable. And Paul boasts... And the Lord of glory crucified. Now, notice, how, notice what Paul says, may I never boast first. Now, that word, that phrase there is, is immensely strong in the original language. Our translations say, may I never boast. It is literally the equivalent in the Greek to saying, God forbid. You don't get stronger than that. God forbid that I should boast. He says here, Now, did Paul have any reasons to boast? Did Paul have reasons to boast? I was thinking about Paul's Paul's life as I was considering this sermon. I just started, I grabbed my pen and I just started jotting down things that the New Testament reveals about Paul. And I want to read them out so I don't miss any. Did Paul have any reason to boast? He was an apostle of Jesus. He had apostolic authority put upon him. He was a leader of the early church. He preached in the power of the Holy Spirit and he saw innumerable conversions. He planted churches around the world. He was responsible for the gospel going to the ends of the earth as Jesus commissioned. He saw the risen Jesus personally at a later time than everyone else. He had visions from God. He, at one point, was transported into heaven and was given a vision of what heaven is like and was brought back to earth. He suffered more for Jesus than any other Christian. He had spiritual gifts, even the greatest spiritual gift, which is prophecy, the Scripture says. He performed miracles, signs and wonders, and he cast out demons. How is that for a catalogue of reasons to boast? If anyone could boast, it was this man. And all of that, that's not even to mention the power of his intellect. 
This, this mania, he was a former Pharisee. He was educated in literature. He was schooled in Hebrew. He was schooled in Greek. He was able to go to synagogues and refute any Jew. He was able to go to lecture halls and refute any of the Greek philosophers. He could do it all. So gifted by God. And yet, he clings, he boasts in none of it. Such a mighty man, such a mighty intellect, such a gifted man who's being willing to be called a fool by preaching the foolishness of the cross. Willing to be considered a fool. No wonder why God used him to win so many souls. No wonder why God used him to catch so many fish. He was a fisher of men. Consider here the word boast. May I, not, may I never boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That word boast there, it literally means to glory, to exult, to rejoice, to revel in. May I glory in nothing else. That word boast, that word glory, it is for a person to be consumed with something. It is the driving passion You cast all of your life upon this. Everything you see in this world is filtered through this lens. It is the controlling passion. And he says, I glory in nothing except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we ask the question, why does the Christian, why does the Christian boast and glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? Why? Let me give a few reasons. Because in it, we see the wisdom of God. In it, we see the wisdom of God. Through the cross, we see God make a way where there was no way. There was no way. How can an earthly judge pardon a guilty criminal? How can he? It doesn't matter how much the judge loves the criminal. If he is to be just and righteous, the criminal must be punished. He has to be. You cannot have justice and pardon together. You can't. Either the judge will punish the guilty criminal and uphold justice, or the judge will pardon the guilty criminal and will now become guilty himself of doing evil. You can't have both But in the cross, we see the very wisdom of God. What do we see in the cross? We see God sending his son, condemning sin, punishing sin, the guilt of sin in the person of his son so that he can set sinners free. His justice is satisfied and at the same time, he can let guilty criminals walk free and he still remains just. The cross, we boast in it because it is the wisdom of God. Where there was no way, he made a way. Do you marvel at the Red Sea being parted? Why do we boast in the cross? Secondly, we boast in it because it deals with the heart of man. It deals with the heart of man. Every religion, every religion deals with symptoms. Every religion targets the external. They all share it in common. They're trying to mend our ways. It's a reformation from the outside. But what's the problem? Scripture teaches the problem is our heart. The evil comes. The wickedness comes from our hearts. The Bible says, Jeremiah says, the heart is sick, it is desperately wicked, it is deceitful above all things. The thing that resides in you is more deceitful than the devil. It's deceitful above all things. Our problem is the internal, not the external. The problem is our evil hearts. Understand, psychology can't cure it. Medicine can't reach it. Science can't reform it. Turning over a new leaf cannot heal it. Ask me, show me, how has science, how has evolution, how has it made a single wicked person become holy? It doesn't. 
How has postmodernism, how has all our philosophy, all of our education, how has, it made, how has it made a sinner now hate his sin? It doesn't. It doesn't. Only the cross work of Jesus, it gets, it, it alone penetrates the heart of man. It alone heals us. It alone brings the change. It's the cross. And so when we see the cross, it doesn't just rescue us from hell. It changes us on the inside. When religion out there seeks to deal with the external, the cross deals with the internal. How can I say that? Look with me at verse 15. Paul says this. Look at him contrast religion with the cross. Verse 15. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Do you see that? The gospel gives us what nothing else can give, a new creation. What's he saying here? He tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. What's he teaching? You must be born again or you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. You must be born again or you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And the cross deals with our greatest need. It defeats the tyranny and enslavement of sin that has a hold of our heart. We were under its authority. We were under its dominion. And it releases us from that. It sets us free. It makes us hate the sin we once loved. And it makes us love the, once God, the God we once despised. Why is that? Because when we look on the cross, when we look at our Savior... We see the one now that we love suffering for our sin. It was our sin that held him there. I want nothing to do with it anymore. Because my Savior hung for it. It's powerful. Why else do we boast in the cross and glory in the cross? Because the cross of Christ shows us the love of God. It shows us the love of God in it. In the cross of our Lord Jesus, we see how wide we sung of it. How wide, how deep, how high, how long is the love of God towards us in Christ Jesus. That unfathomable love, the eternal Father, He hands over. He delivers up. He has His Son, His eternal Son crucified for us. He sends His Son to die for us and we behold Jesus, the eternal Son, willingly laying down his life for us. As the old Puritan John Flavel used to say, you need to imagine before the creation of the world, the conversation that happened between the Father and the Son before Jesus came. What was that conversation between the Father and the Son? It was a conversation about redeeming a humanity that would be undone in sin, helpless and hopeless. And what did the Father and the Son say? As they came up with the plan of redemption, the father says to the son, Son, understand this. If I spare them, I cannot spare you. And the son responds to the father, Content, father. So great is your love for them. So great is our love for them. Bringing all their bills, bringing all their debts, Bring in all their guilt, bring in all their filth, lay it upon me, I can take it. So great is his love for us. So great is his love for us, and he takes our place. And when we look at that cross, we see his cross had every single one of our names on it. It should have been us. It should have been us on there, but he, he was crucified because he loved us. You didn't go to that cross, and I didn't. He did. What does Romans 5 tell us? That God demonstrates his own love to us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's how he demonstrates love. You see, God didn't wait for us to love him. He didn't wait for humanity to stop rebelling against him. While we were still sinners, he sent Christ, and Christ died for us. That is his love. He did it for enemies. Why else does the Christian boast and glory in the cross? Because in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see the glory of God. We see the glory of God through the cross. God 
rescues an innumerable multitude of souls who were destined to hell. And he does it through his son taking on flesh, becoming like his creatures and dying in their place. We see the glory of God. On Calvary, we behold the everlasting one dying. When you look at Calvary and you see that criminal on there, that's Emmanuel. That is Emmanuel. We behold God with us, killed by us, killed for us. Slain by the ones he came to save. And this is a puzzling glory, isn't it, that we look into. The King, crowned in the splendor of thorns. We see perfect holiness, dressed and covered in the sin of the world. We see him who is the king cursed for us to save sinners. And we see the cross, that, that shameful, horrendous, offensive cross. We see it become his throne. It becomes his throne. What do I mean by that? When we read Revelation, what are we going to be worshipping him day and night for? Praise, glory and honour to the lamb who was slain for us. The cross becomes his throne and we glory in it. Do you see why Paul boasted and gloried in the cross? Do you see why? You see, you cannot boast in self and Jesus at the same time. You can't. You can't. You cannot boast in what you do or in your achievements or in your ministry or in your efforts or in how good you were that week and Jesus at the same time because the cross shows us you were helpless and you were hopeless and the cross screams out to us, look what it took. Look what it took. Look what it took. The Son of God. So through whom, him we are rescued. And now the Christian glories and boasts in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say that with Paul? Can you say that with him? Has the cross so moved you? Has, has the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ so transformed you? Has it taken the center of everything in you? Is it your controlling passion that, so that you say with Paul, it makes sense. I do. I boast with you in Christ. In Christ. Can you say that with him? Every single person here, can you say it with him? Well, cross number one brings a Christian to another cross. I said there are three crosses that belong to every Christian. The first cross brings two other crosses. What is the second cross? The world has been crucified to us. Look at verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me. See what he says here. Believing in the cross, glorying in the cross, leads a person to start building a cross and to put something on it. That's what it does. Who does the Christian put on the cross? Paul says, the world. The world is crucified to me now. What's he referring to, the world? Because the Bible uses the world in different terms. For God so loved the world, right? Right? This people that he has made. Is it referring to this cosmos? Is it referring to every single person here? No, no, no. The Bible also has much to say about the world. And when it uses it in the negative sense, it's referring to the satanic order. It's referring to this realm that is in opposition to God. It is referring to the religion of self, of pleasure, of selfish ambition, the love of money and greed. The love of possessions. That's what it's referring to. It's referring to the entire population of unbelievers who are in opposition to God. It's referring to the wisdom, the values, and the principles of this world that is under the governance of Satan. That's what he's talking about here. Everything that is opposed to the will and word of God. What does it say in Romans chapter 12, verse 2? Do not be conformed to this world. Don't be like it. And Paul says, it is crucified to me. How can you spot a person who glories in the cross? 
How can you spot a person who boasts in the cross? How do you spot the Christian who is true and genuine? How do you do it? Look at their hands. They're covered with blood. They're covered with blood. The world has been crucified to them. Nailed to the cross. It's been put to death because the world is seen for what it is and now the Christian treats the world as it should be treated. It's a liar. The world lies to us. It promises us you can live however you want and still get to heaven. It is a thief. It robs us of our best years. It is a murderer of souls because it leads a multitude to hell. It is an empty vessel because it promises to satisfy and it leaves you empty. And the Christian recognizes that and crucifies it. What does it look like to have the world crucified? What does it look like? It means the world no longer has an appeal to you. It means you're no longer attracted to it. It it means you look at its wisdom and its philosophy of life, everything that it values and tells you to pursue, and you look at it and you say, it is foolishness. It is foolishness. You despise its ways. You despise what it revels in. You do not care for its approval, and you do not fear its threats, because it is the one that's crucified. You care not for what it has to offer. It will sell shiny things and you care not for it because you know that you cannot bring it with you in glory and you know that it will be eaten up by moth and rust. That's what Christ said. And now, let, don't mistake me here. The world will still try to tempt us and in weakness, in weakness we may still bite but we're no longer under its dominion. We're no longer under its authority. We no longer follow follow its marching orders because we now have a new Lord. This is why our gospel teaches you believe and receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. You have a new master now. It's not the world. You have a new Lord. And so the one who boasts and glories in the cross, they can say with Paul, I have nailed the world hand and foot to the cross and it will not rise in three days to come and master me again because I have a new master now and the world has been crucified. Again, I have to ask you, is that you? Is that you? Do you glory and boast at the cross? Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Are they covered in blood? Have you crucified this world? Or do you love this world? Do you pursue the things of this world? Do you love it? Do you follow it? Do you camouflage with this world? Do you enjoy what it joy enjoys? Where is your delight? Is it in the cross of Christ? Or is it in other things? You have to ask the question, honestly, can you say with Paul to the Philippians, for me to live is Christ? It's Christ. What does the Bible say about this? There are tremendous warnings. Tremendous warnings. 1 John 2.15 Do not love the world or the things of the world. If you do, the love of the Father is not in you. That's what it says. What does James 4.4 4 say? You adulterers, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Are you in friendship and partner with the world? You've made yourself God's enemy. That's what he says. You can't boast in Christ and love the world. We need to treat this world with utter seriousness. The cross of Christ must drive the way we treat this world. You cannot approach this world delicately. Do you remember what Paul says about Demas in, 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 one, in, in 2 Timothy? Remember what he says? With tears, Paul writes, Demas has deserted me. Because he loved this present world. Paul's Paul's fellow church planter, fellow evangelist, deserted because he loved the present world. Understand, don't treat the world lightly. It will make any Judas sell Jesus for 30 silver coins. It will. And Jesus says there will be many Judases to come. Remember the parable of the soils. Many who profess my name will fall away because they get entangled in the, in the pleasures of this world. 
Do not treat it lightly. It, the gospel must cause you to crucify the world. That's how you know when you glory in the cross. Because it's nailed there. And finally, the cross of Christ brings us to one last cross. One last cross. Cross number three. We have been crucified to the world. We have been crucified to the world. Look at verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You see, embracing Christ crucified led the world to crucifying Paul. It did. It absolutely did. It made Paul an enemy in their eyes. He became an enemy. And he says, I am now. I have become crucified to this world. They have crucified me. Can Paul say that with integrity? Think back upon his life. He was that well-learned Pharisee. He was highly esteemed. He was surpassing all of his peers. He was called rabbi. And then he embraced the cross. And when you read the book of Acts, what happens to him? They call him a madman. They say he's out of his mind. They say he's become a fool. They treat him as an enemy. He, who once was their hero, has now become a villain to them. And they hunted him like a wild beast. They assaulted him and they sought that he be rid from this earth. Do you see the change? And so he was crucified to the world. Crucified to the world. Hear his own words. Look at verse 17. Hear his own words. Look what he writes. Incredible words. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. There's a man who's been crucified to the world. He suffered for Christ. He was opposed because of Christ. And if you were to lift up his shirt, you would shrink back in horror because of all the scars for following Christ. Why does, we have to ask the question, why does glorying in the cross, why does boasting in the cross cause the world to crucify us, to oppose us, to persecute us? Why does it do that? Because the cross preaches that we need saving. The cross preaches that we can only be made right with God through the merits of another, that yours are filthy rags. The cross says you're guilty. You're guilty, and people do not like that. The world does not like that. Let me quote John Stott. Many of you know him, famous Christian author. He says this, quote, Nothing in history or in the universe cuts us down to size like the cross. All of us have inflated views of ourselves, especially in self-righteousness, until we have visited a place called Calvary. It is there at the foot of the cross that we shrink to our true size. And of course, people do not like it. They resent the humiliation of seeing themselves as God sees them and as they really are. Christ crucified, they detest. And if preachers preach Christ crucified, they are opposed for it. They're ridiculed and persecuted. Why? Because of the wounds which they inflict on man's pride. End quote. The world crucifies the true Christians and we're charged as fundamentalists, bigots, extremists. We should be silenced. We should be gagged. We should be removed from this world. We are the reason why there's so much fighting and trouble in the world. It's you fundamentalists. And the world crucifies the Christian. And this is why the false teachers change the gospel. And this is why it's changed today. Do you see why it, what Paul says in verse 12 about them? Look again at verse 12. Those who want to make a good impression upon you outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. Why? The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Take away that men are incredibly sinful and they can't contribute. Take it away that they can't keep the law before God. Take away a palatable religion and they'll crucify you. And the false teachers, Paul says, they do it because they want to avoid persecution. The false teachers, they want to avoid being crucified to the world. They want the world's approval. But the true Christian doesn't. And so as I close here, we have to ask ourselves, has, is this said of us? Have we been crucified 
to the world. This third aspect here, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, it brings about a great divorce. It breaks up that once unholy union between us and the world. It breaks it up. We love the world and it loved us and Christ breaks it. And, and do, you see, do you see in it, do you see the mutuality of this divorce? Do you see the mutuality? This is what the cross produces. The world is crucified to me and I am crucified to the world. Do you see the mutuality there? I once loved the world. I'm no longer attracted to it. This world has also fallen out of love with me. This is what the cross does. It's powerful, my friends, it's powerful. And it transforms a person. How do you spot a person who glories and boasts in the cross? When you look at them, you see them hanging from a cross. You see them hanging from a cross because they've been crucified to this world. They're rejected, they're opposed, they're cast out, and they're set aside. So, again, do you fit in with this world does this world love you? Are you one of its own? Or have you been rejected? Have you been crucified? Have you been opposed by it? Do you remember those words that Jesus says? I don't know how many times I've heard it quoted. I don't know how many times you've heard it quoted. Jesus said this, If anyone would follow me, he must deny himself and pick up his cross. He must pick up his cross. You must be crucified to this world or you're not his disciple. I don't know how else to say it. Do you glory and boast in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ? There are three crosses that belong to every Christian. The cross that it boasts in, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second cross is this world is crucified to us. And the third cross is I am crucified to this world. Can that be said of you? Not do you admire the cross. Not do you acknowledge it's true. Not do you accept it as a historical fact. Not even just do you believe it. Yes, that's how a person's saved. But the evidence, I'm talking about the evidence. Do you glory? Do you boast in the cross? Is it the center of your life? Because Christ has promised us three crosses the Christian has three crosses let me pray our Father in heaven we thank you for your word it is perfect as the psalmist says your word is perfect converting the soul converting the soul I pray oh God that you would be dealing with each of us here for those of us who have come to glory in the cross, I pray that we would leave even more in love with our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray for those who do belong to Christ, that we could say with a hand over our heart, with the psalmist, I pant for the Lord, up for the Lord as a deer pants for the water. So I thirst for the Lord. I pray this of your people, that again, again they may boast and glory in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray for any tonight who may have admired the cross. They can speak about the cross. They can defend the cross. They can articulate the doctrines of the cross. But for those who do not boast and glory in the cross, who have not been transformed by it, I pray, I pray, O oh great God, by your Holy Spirit, may you take out that old heart of stone and replace it with a new one that is branded with the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. May you do this, O oh Lord, for your name's sake, for you are worthy and that you might get glory, and that Christ may receive the full reward of all that he suffered for. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing.